So, um, just before I start, this is a painting of the Supreme War Council members at work. Um, so why this title? The first part of the title, Ambush by Victory, addresses the idea that the Allies, that being Britain, France, Italy, and America, did not know the war was going to end in 1918 when it did. In fact, they were surprised when the Germans called for an armistice. The second part of the title, Allied Strategy on How to Win the First World War, refers to how, within this context of surprise, the Allies spent much of the year coordinating an Allied strategy for 1919, the year they believed the war um, could <clears throat> excuse me, the year they believed they could end the war. Well, this strategy incorporated all theaters of war, and in the broader context of my work, I look at these other theaters. Today, I'm going to geographically focus on the Franco-Belgian front. I'm going to show you a piece of the Allies' plan for 1919, first by examining Allied discussions on how much manpower they required for a major offensive in 1919 against their main adversary, the Germans, and second, by looking at Allied discussions over how to supply a large American army in Europe. With this paper, I'm going to make two arguments. The first is that the Allies pursued a notion of victory that was focused on a decisive military defeat of the German army. Their timeline to victory over the enemy was affected by their perception of the enemy's strength. As the Allies unintentionally overestimated the German capabilities, they assumed they would have to carry the war into 1919. The second argument is that, through the mechanism of the Supreme War Council, the Allies were able to successfully coordinate strategy and resources. The abrupt ending of the war was obscu has obscured a historians' understanding of coalition warfare in the First World War, as they have not sufficiently considered the serious planning that took place for 1919. Um, what few historians have examined the Supreme War Council have largely focused on the Executive War Board and Foch's evolution to becoming um, Allied Commander-in-Chief on the Western Front. And while some historians have considered the Supreme War Council as a forum for the exchange of ideas, many have done so dismissively. So just a brief overview of what it was and why it was created. It was established in November 1917 in the wake of the Italian setback at Caporetto, and it was a joint effort between the British, French, Americans, and Italians. And as an aside, um, while recognizing that the Al um, Americans were technically an associate power, when the Supreme War Council wrote in their documents, they said allies, and that included the Americans, so I'm just going to use the generic term allies. So the Supreme War Council was created for the better coordination of military action on the Western Front. However, it did so by looking at the general conduct of over the entire um, war, that being all theaters. The main body of the Supreme War Council was the political side, which you can see here at the top. It met monthly at Versailles and consisted of two representatives from each of the nations. The head of the government was a permanent member, and while the second representative varied depending on the topic of discussion, they tended to be the foreign minister or secretary of state for war. <coughs> However, fearf fearful of losing diplomatic independence, President Wilson refused to sit on this political committee. Um, however, he sent Arthur Frazier, the American ambassador to Paris, to act as, quote, an ear but not a mouth. While the Supreme War Council had no executive power, these men could use their positions within their government to advocate the implementation of the agreements made by the Supreme War Council, which they did. The political body was advised in military matters by the permanent military representatives, which here. They were instructed to analyze the military situation from the broad view of the Allies, and not just of their own country. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just getting over that cold everyone's had. <clears throat> <clears throat> so they functioned at the level comparable to that of the general staffs, and created a strategy that considered all of the theaters of war in relation to one another. They recommended general policies in those theaters, and rarely considered specific operational details and never considered tactics. What they created was a guideline, not a detailed plan, of what should happen in the autumn of 1918 and the year 1919 in the context of the entire war. The military representatives offered an alternative opinion to the national ones put forward by the general staffs in each country. Like the general staffs, they considered the global perspective of the war. But unlike them, they examined the capabilities of the coalition as opposed to merely national ones. The result was that um, they were able to make rec recommendations on how best to coordinate the coalition effort, which included um, identifying existing areas of poor coordination and advising on the creation of a number of subcommittees. <clears throat> 
From the onset, the Supreme War Council was given greater authority by the Americans' willingness to use it as a main conduit of communication with their European allies. So now to examining a bit of the strategy. As part of the wider strategy for winning the war, the thinking and planning done by the Allied political and military leadership illustrates the predominance of the Franco-Belgian Front as the main theater of war and the German as the main enemy of the coalition. The final decisive campaign would be fought in 1919 because the Allied political and military leadership that, as well as being the earliest time the American, that American manpower would give the Allies sufficient numerical superiority, um, it, would, it was also the extent of time Allied morale could be maintained. In this way, the Allies could overwhelm the German army in France and dictate the peace terms. After the Allies' shock at the Battle of Caporetto and the subsequent German spring offensives, the Allies were determined never to underestimate the enemy again. They feared that the Germans were holding substantial manpower resources in the east, that being the Russian front, while at the same time recruiting forces from the local Russian populations. In an attempt to be prudent, the permanent military representatives consistently overestimated the capabilities of the German war machine. Until the war ended, the Allies were never sure as to where all of the German divisions were, lo were located. They were always concerned that German divisions on the Russian front would be moved to any of the other theaters. Due to the Central Powers' advantage of interior lines of communication, the Allies feared they would not detect troop movements until it was too late. This sort of is a bit how they saw the Germans. To achieve a military victory, the Allies argued that they required a substantial numerical strength over the Germans. It was through the expansion of the American army that the Allies looked to gain this advantage, as British and French manpower resources were withering. The idea to expand the American army to 100 divisions was first discussed by the Allies in June 1918 at a meeting of the Supreme War Council. The German spring offensives were well underway, and while the Allies were concerned with how to stave off the immediate threat, they also discussed how to maintain and improve their manpower reserves um, for the future. Marshal Foch, newly appointed Ally Generalissimo, presented the idea of the Americans having 100 divisions by July 1919 as a solution to obtaining numerical supremacy over the Germans in France. Foch was most concerned about the size of the British Army, um, that it was decreasing faster <coughs> than the AEF was increasing. He estimated that the relative strength of the armies in France was 150 Allied divisions to 204 German ones. If the American army could immediately begin its expansion, this would improve both the um, immediate problem of dwindling manpower and the future military prospects of the Allied coalition. Both the British and the French military representatives, <coughs> sorry, both the British and the French prime ministers illustrated their support for the 100 division program at this Supreme War Council meeting. Following this session, the idea of an expanded American army was presented to the American president by telegram. Aware of President Wilson's support for Foch, the Supreme War Council members made their case that in order to obtain numerical supremacy, which, quote, the Allied commander judged indispensable for final victory, end quote, the Americans would have to, co to comprise a total force of 100 divisions in France. This idea entailed the massive expansion of the United States program, given that the original one force saw 30 American divisions, that being approximately 1,372,000 uh, troops, in France by the 31st of December 1918. It was the first time that such a figure had been recommended, and as General John J. Pershing, the commander of the AEF, later, recollect, later recollected, the Allied generals, quote, grew more and more fearful lest the enemy might still have untold reserves ready to swell his forces, end quote. President Wilson res Wilson's response to the telegram was positive. He even went so far as to state that he thought the Americans might be able to exceed estimates for manpower in 1919. Like Foch, the military representatives were also concerned about manpower projections for 1919. The military representatives agreed that to win the war, they required a supremacy of one million rifles over the Germans on the Franco-Belgian front. They used the idea that one side had always had a supremacy of 250,000 rifles in this theater the Allies through to 1917 and the Germans at the beginning of 1918 without breaking the other side. They reasoned that German success in the spring of 1918 was due to the fact that the Germans had half the distance to travel to reach the Allies' vital points, 
and that if they had double their superiority, that being 500,000 rifles, then they would have reached them. Following this logic, in order to reach the Germans' vital points, which were defined as, quote, points which will cause the whole German line to crumble, end quote, they needed twice what the German figure for success would have been, so that is one million uh, superiority in rifle strength, given the extra distance the Allies had to reach these areas. Just a comparison. So the, the military representatives then compared Allied and enemy str rifle strength for the 1st of July, 1919. As you can see, they estimated that the British forces would comprise 400,000 rifles, the French 461, the Belgian 42,000, and the Portuguese 20,000 rifles, which, uh, as an aside, Haig later saw this and wrote that the Portuguese were of no use directly on the document, that was how he felt about them. The current American program would see um, the, Amer yeah, the Americans contribute 465,000 rifles, giving the Allies a total of 1,388,000 uh, 300, rifles. In comparison, they estimated that Germans could draw infantry manpower from a variety of sources, as illustrated in this, in this uh, slide on the left-hand side. There's 165,000 men in depots, 450 from the conscription class of 1920. They were also drawing men from the previous conscription class. And they thought they could get 12 divisions from the Eastern Theater, and also a substantial amount from P POs, POWs released from Allied custody, totaling 325,000 from conquered territories, and another 675,000 from returned <coughs> wounded and sick. So they were quite optimistic about what the Germans could field. And although these sources contributed, altogether these sources contributed just over two million men, including current forces and wastage, which assumed heavy fighting in spring 1919 and thus high losses. The total infantry strength of the German army on the Franco-Belgian front um, at the end of June 1919 was estimated to be 1,425,000 rifles, or 178 divisions. They predicted that these figures would continue to de decrease until the class of 1921 became available in the autumn of 1919. So these estimates highlighted a German superiority of 37,000 rifles, and alarmingly meant that the Germans would maintain their numerical advantage over the Allies into July 1919, unless the Allies changed their approach to manpower. The British military representative expressed deep concern over these figures as he believed the Germans would be able to resume an offensive on the Franco-Belgian front by March 1919 and continue it until the autumn. This action would result in the war continuing into 1920 when one of Britain's partners might withdraw from the conflict due to war weariness. They argued that Germany would be able to increase its strength as it had access to materials in Russia. So the military representative studies reinforced the need for a much larger American army. It was the 100 Division program that could give the Allies this 1 million rifle superiority they believed was necessary to win a decisive victory. But despite the support the 100, 100 Division program had gained from the European Allies, from the Supreme War Council, and from President Wilson, the reality was that the American War Department was conducting their own study on what was possible. And rather than endorsing the 100 Division program, they estimated that the American program could be expanded to 80 divisions by the 30th of June 1919. The issue was complicated by the fact that Pershing uh, continued to promote the 100 Division program. While the War Department sent these figures to the American uh, permanent military representative, that being Tasker Bliss, um, he never received the telegram and therefore did not clarify with his European partners that the 80 division program was the official one and it took nearly a month to rectify the situation. The result was that disorganization and poor communication between the AEF in Europe and the War Department in Washington made it incredibly difficult for the Allies to coordinate the resources they required for the 1919 program. Um, to give you an idea of what this would have meant in terms of recruitment and shipping, I that, that's the War Department estimate. Um, so the main points to look at are the um, heavy fighting they expected to undertake in 1919, which you can see here by the re replacement troops. 
Um, the total size of the AAF in Europe would have been 3,360,000 men in France. That's excluding the 400,000 in wastage. By shipping an additional 2,760,000 troops, the American Army would reach its 80 division target by the 30th, 30th of June 1919. However, the figures provided by Pershing had led the Europeans to, to contemplate a total force of 4,700,000 or 940,000 um, more men than the War Department figures. Pershing had interpreted 80 divisions uh, to mean 80 combat divisions with 16 depot divisions um, extra, in effect a total force um, equal to approximately 96 divisions. Furthermore, per Pershing had communicated these inflated figures to his European partners. Uh, here's the total troops shipped. Um, so the American Secretary of War, Newton D. Baker, was appalled to learn that Pershing conceived of transporting 300,000 troops per month, that, um, which is in comparison to what the war, those estimates that the War Department was making. And then Pershing wanted to increase it to 350,000 per month from January to June 1919. As the above table illustrates, these figures are in gross estimation of the War Department's. The problem that developed was that Pershing's grossly inflated figures had confused the British shipping authorities. Not only were these figures central to the provision of adequate troop transport, but they were also the figures on which cargo tonnage was based. The inefficiency caused by the War Department and Pershing were not, uh, not working on the same program were twofold. At the national level, it meant that the War Department was not preparing the men and resources that Pershing required in Europe, and at the international level, the Americans complicated allied relationships by not communicating what their uh, shipping needs were. Oh, just some eye candy. Um, now that I've discussed how the allies responded to their fear of an unrelenting German menace with the expansion of the American army, I'm going to move to discussing the organization. Nope, I'm just giving you, excuse me of the Allied resources, um, specifically the issue of cargo tonnage for the American program. When the War Department approved the 80 Division program in July, the issue of cargo tonnage and troop tonnage was at the forefront of their concerns. Although by the summer of 1918, the convoy system had neutralized the submarine menace and Allied shipbuilding finally equaled shipping losses, the expanded military program significantly altered the shipping situation for the second half of 1918 and the year 1919. By this time, the European allies had expected that the Americans uh, would be contributing shipping to the overall war effort. Instead, by implementing the 80 division program, that meant the Americans would require further assistance from their coalition partners and would continue to draw upon already stretched allied shipping resources. Originally receiving assistance with troop transport from the British, the American government further increased its demands by asking for substantial assistance with cargo tonnage as well. Furthermore, the American demands did not confine themselves to shipping tonnage. <clears throat> the 80 Division program placed stress on already limited munitions resources too, as the Americans pressed both the French and the British for assurance that they could assist with the supply of artillery, and shells until their own program came through in 1919. At the heart of these discussions was the Allied Maritime Transport Council. Back to this slide so you can see it here, which is there. It was a subcommittee, obviously, of the Supreme War Council. The Allied Maritime Transport Council was established out of the desire to improve the allocation of tonnage and poor communication networks between the coalition. Although it did not have executive power, the connection of its members to the shipping controllers at home resulted in it being at the center of Allied discussions for shipping. Its objective, if objectives were first, quote, to make the most economical use of tonnage under the control of the Allies, uh, second, to allocate that tonnage as between the different needs of the Allies in such a way as to add most to the general war effort, and third, to adjust the program of requirements of the different allies in such a way as to bring them within the scope of the possible carrying power of the tonnage available. To achieve these results, the Maritime Transport Council encouraged each nation to tabulate its requirements for tonnage needed, 
tonnage available, and tonnage likely to be available in the future. This was a massive undertaking that was still underway when the armistice was signed. For neutral and intern tonnage, the vision was to share these uh, ships based on who had the greatest need and allot them accordingly, um, as opposed to tonnage being kept by the country which had seized it. The Maritime Transport Council eventually came to control 500,000 tons of neutral shipping, and while remaining ships stayed under national control, the Allied Maritime Trans Transport Council recommended how this tonnage should be used. An additional goal of the Transport Council was to increase the contribution the U.S. was making to supply <coughs> cargo tonnage. Simultaneously, a number of program committees were created to work alongside the Maritime Transport Council. Each committee member was responsible for gathering information to detail the minimum requirements for their nation. Using this information, the coalition could then come to an agreement with the other representatives for a joint allied program of purchases and imports. So the program committees, which you can see there are a number of them, included ones on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, jute, timber, and coal. Munitions and food were further organized into the Munitions Council and the Industrial Council. These committees were also assisted by the, um, the War Purchases and Finance Council here. So these various committees allowed um, <clears throat> the four nations to discuss and agree upon import requirements for each commodity. Um, the Maritime Transport Council then considered all of the commodities as part of the wider Allied shipping program. So from July to the signing of the armistice, the European allies pressed their American partners for detailed information on their military program and cargo requirements. But again, disorganization with the American war machine resulted in the Americans providing a series of conflicting programs. For example, I'll just some of the data. So for example, um, you see the data provided by Tasker Bliss, which he gave to the other military representatives, which were then sent back to their governments versus what the War Department had also sent to the British Shipping Controller. And they're very inconsistent. <clears throat> what is parti of particular interest is that after February 1919, the War Department estimated that their shipping program would be able to maintain cargo tonnage for their 80 division program without the assistance of their European allies. Um, that was provided that the submarine threat remained neutralized. In comparison, you can see Bliss's study relied on the Allies into June 1919. While the War Department foresaw a total deficit of approximately 4,800,000 deadweight tons from August to the end of February, the American section of the Supreme War Council had calculated that for the same period, the shortage would be nearly double this amount. The main discrepancy between these figures was as a result of Bliss's inclusion of transport for animals, which added an average of 550,000 deadweight tons per month to the tonnage deficit. Bliss had done so under the advice of Foch and Pershing. And again, we see this um, discrepancy between what's going on in Washington and what's going on in Europe, and then the two programs trying to mesh together. So as problems between the Allies in working out a military program mounted, President Wilson instructed um, a Secretary Baker to travel to Europe. He wanted the Secretary of War to work out a complete program of cooperation with the European allies, and thus instructed him to discuss and for formulate all elements involved in the military program for 1919. Meanwhile, the Supreme War Council continued their work. The Maritime Transport Council had asked the Inter-Allied Munitions Council to present Allied artillery, they don't 